not really related to the set, but something I think is most of all. What's your approach to dehumanizing teens, kind of like you did on Body and Soul? Oh, wow. Um, well, that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> Really, my, I guess my whole approach is based on really tritones, tritone subs, um, and, but there's a lot of other things I do, but uh, you know, half steps, playing, and playing tunes in different keys. And, well, you know, while well, rhythm six is playing, and I'm like, you know, you know, playing in another key at the same time. But really, you know, I would, it's really, what I do is really tritone based, um, but I like to use the two chord as well. Try going, try going on the two, five, whole two five, not just on the, not just on the, on the five chord, or the flat two. Can I show you? Okay. So. Okay, so traditionally the try tone sub is really like it's like flat, right two flat two one, right? Right. But I like to I like to put the the, the try tone on the two chord. So make a two five. It's key is C. So D minor G, A flat minor, C major. So the two is in there as well. So you can you can do that resolving or non-resolving. So like um, like a case of a non-resolving tritone sub would be like the bridge of I got rhythm, right? So rhythm changes really th is three six two five in in the key, all dominant chord, right? So D D seven in the key B flat it'd be D seven, G seven, C seven, F seven, right? So this the bridge would be you put this, so you make a two five out of the do, out of the five, out of the dominant chords. So you make an A minor D, then the tritone sub of that. So and so it becomes a non-resolving two five with the tritone sub going through the cycle of fours. So that's kind of you know kind of an introductory way of how I do that. Uh, basically, anytime there's a two, a measure of a two and a measure of a, a five, and usually and if it goes to a one, you can do that, of course. You compress the two five into one measure, and then the second measure, you, you can play that two five and try to play away. Oh. Right? So, like a tune like It's You or No, or like a, a There'll Never Be Another You. Does everybody know There'll Never Be Another You? Mm -hmm. So, you get them. <laughs> okay, so the, so the way I would get there is. <laughs> D flat, C, F, F sharp, B, B flat, E flat, E, A, A flat major. See what I mean? So you can press those two fives. So that, those are, those are non-resolving two fives that go down in whole steps, right? So you get to the four chord. It's actually quite simple. It very, it just makes, I mean, it's, it's very mathematical. Um, so that's really it. That's my concept in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell. I do that all the time. On you know every tune, like I was doing it on uh, on Donna Lee when you go. That's a G seven, right? But it's D minor G A flat D flat da da G minor C C sharp F sharp F, right? So Donna Lee comes. It's like it's a big 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 circle. You gotta shed it, yeah. You, know, you have to just have to practice it. You know, a really good thing. This is actually the only good thing a real book is good for is that you can like go through the real book and then write all the tritone subs in on all the tunes. <laughs> Other than that, it's kind of useless. But <laughs> but I mean, a real book. If you could do that, like take a tune like you know whatever, audible, just go from A to Z in the real book and just use it as a as a as a place. Oh, I can use a tritone. Oh, 
oh, this works, oh, you can, it's, 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 it's almost a visual thing, you have to see it. Once you see how it works, then it makes, starts to make sense. You know what I mean? Is it so that, so, you know, mark up your real book. That's, you know, that's good, it's that good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to make books growing up. So does that make sense? Yes. I hope I would like that was a really uh, Reader's Digest version of that. We'll take one more. So how exactly would you recommend like getting your name out there as a as a Barry Sax specific player, and not like a saxophone, but like Barry baritone specific? Play the baritone specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, just this, this whole thing about getting your name out there is. I mean, you know, the thing is, people have to hear you, right? You could be the greatest saxophone player in the world, but if you never leave your basement, who cares, mm -hmm. right? So people are going to get to hear by going out and play. I mean, you know, that's that's how we all, I mean, we all went out, and we hung out a lot. You have to hang out and play, right? And then when you show up, you play the baritone. Oh, that guy plays baritone, right? People have to hear you play the baritone. It's really important. Um, so you know, that's a, that's an, an, another interesting subject to, it, that you know the. One of the best things about being a musician is the social part, right? This, this, I mean, our society is becoming so fractured and individualistic, and everyone's in their own world on their phones, and they have little, you know, their little Apple iPhones on, and they're talking to themselves and looking at iPads and computers. It's like music is the opposite. Music is a social thing, and you know, and if music really brings people together, and playing together is uh, that's really one of the best things about about playing music is that it's a, you know. It's a, it's a it's a way of a com bringing community together, right? I mean, we when when I was in you know in school before I was in school, high school and college, man, we I mean, just we practiced and hung out, listened to records all the time. But we went to clubs and played and sat in. You have to be you have to be visible, right? I mean, it's important. Um, but in terms of getting your name out as a as a baritone specific, that's just uh, that happens. That's a very organic process. That's something that can't be forced on. You know, you can't artificially make that happen. You just have to play and get better. And not even worry about that so much. You know what I mean? It's like just worry about getting better and yeah. being a better baritone player. And just that's going to just happen very organically and very naturally. I mean, that's just for everybody. That, that answer is a question for everybody, no matter what instrument you play. This is all a very natural, organic process. You know, we, um, I don't know. We never really worried about our careers. We worried about getting better. You know, we were, we were concerned with playing learning how to play music and be better musicians and be better people. You know, that was always, that was really at the forefront of what we were trying to do. Um, and we, and because of that, you know, gigs came. Like it was just, uh, you know, it was nothing, I, I, nothing that, we, that, you know, that people I grew up with and people I went out playing with, none of this was really forced. It's just if you can play and, uh, you know, you're, I mean, you're gonna work. What that is, you know, who knows? But it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. You're working, right? I mean, that's that's really the bottom line of all of this. I was talking to Professor Bell. I'm talking about how you know, mus musicians were, uh, you know, we're blue collar workers, right? I mean, that's really you know. And I learned that when I was playing with Woody Herman. We were one day we'd be playing at Carnegie Hall, and the next day we'd get on a plane and fly to Indiana, play at play at an Elks Club for our 60th wedding anniversary for some couple, and the music was the same. We didn't. We didn't treat that gig any differently than if you when he was playing at Carnegie Hall, you know. So, I just think there's a certain sensibility we have to bring to how we play and how we approach music in general. I think it's really important. Um, but just by virtue of being a, a good baritone player, in your case, and just playing the baritone, um, things are going to happen. It's just, uh, I mean, there aren't a lot of dedicated baritone players. That's another thing. There's a lot of tenor players and alto players. So just by virtue of Playing the instrument well, and people hearing you, you know that's uh, things are going to happen. And I don't, I wouldn't really put too much energy or emphasis or anxiety into that, you know. But, um, so yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, being a dedicated baritone is no different than being a dedicated cellist. Or de if you're dedicated to your instrument, just be the best at it you can possibly be. You know, and uh, and just by virtue of that, you're gonna things are gonna happen for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And don't you know? Don't be so self-critical and so you know beat yourself up about any of 
this. So, someone asked Izzy Gillespie once, and this is I, I think about this all the time. Is uh, uh, you know, what, what was his definition of being a musician? And he said, "Well, I wake up every day and I play the trumpet, and some days I win, and some days the trumpet wins, <laughs> and I do that every day for my whole life, and then I die, and the trumpet wins." <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the most beautiful definition of being a musician, right? Because really, it's a, it, it's just it's just like basically saying you know live in the present, you know be the best you can be today, right? Because tomorrow, who knows? Yesterday is gone. You can't do anything about that. So hopefully, everybody's going to have a long series of todays for their life. Because tomorrow, who knows? A piano could fall on your head today. And who knows what's going to happen? You have today, so play as well as you can today. And, and don't be so judgmental and self-critical and, and, and beat yourself up. Just, uh, that's it, that's all we can do. Is today, uh, you know, hopefully you'll win. And maybe tomorrow your instrument will win. You know, so, but it's just, you just go back and forth and do that every day. And uh, uh, music is, you know, the really great thing about music is that it's all, it's, it's about the process, it's about the journey, it's not about arriving. We never arrive anywhere as musicians. We never get, it's not like, oh, I got my degree, I'm done. You know, it's not like that. Music is all about process. It's not about arrival. There's always something else to get over the heart. Even like, you know, the greatest musicians in the world, Charlie Parker, Coltrane, Pablo Casal, I mean, all the greatest, it's like practiced all the time. Just, it was just, uh, uh, it, it's really process driven. And so just, you know, get into that, the head of that, just like, you, and. So just make the best contribution you can today, because that's what you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I was going to ask, um, just to give everybody a little bit of background on you and your work, you actually grew up alongside one of our professors, our reigning professor, Rich DeRosa, on Long Island. And I was wondering if you could talk about a little bit about that. And also, too, um, we were, he was telling me a funny story about playing in a wedding band with Kenny Werner, who was one of our guest artists last year. Yeah, we, were, uh, we did a lot of weddings uh, growing up. I, I was in a wedding band. We played weddings in bar mitzvahs, and uh, we would do one on Friday, two on Saturday, two on Sunday. And we did this for many years. It was Kenny Warner on piano, myself, uh, great trumpet player, Glenn Drews, who actually got me on Willie Herman's band, Billy Drews, who plays uh, saxophone in the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, and Larry Farrow, who plays trombone with, uh, well, he's played you know, with Willie Herman as well, but he plays with the Blues Brothers. So I mean, this is we growing up. We had an opportunity to play all kinds of gigs like this, and uh, I mean, it wasn't uh, you know that's what I mean about music being you know your blue collar worker. You know, you show up at the Plaza Hotel in your tuxedo and you play a bar mitzvah. Then you drive another you know in the afternoon. The next day you drive to Jersey Shore and play a, an Italian wedding. Then you the next day you get in your car and you drive to somewhere else and you play a, you know another bar mitzvah. I and mean, we did hundreds of these gigs. Um, but man, it was, it was uh, we learned a lot. First of all, you have to know a lot of tunes, right, to play those kind of gigs. You have to play for a cocktail hour of an hour and then a four hour gig. So you're playing four hours a night, uh, five hours a night, and then if, if you were really unlucky, you get an hour overtime, uh, which was the worst. It was like, you got an hour overtime, like, oh, get home at five in the morning instead of four. But anyway, so you know that's and I just hope that you guys can take, have gigs like that because that's uh, it pays well and puts food on your table and uh, you can pay your rent and uh, you know it's just uh, it's just you have a, you're playing your instrument that's never a bad thing so but I did I grew up on Long Island and um, coming up in the seventies and uh, was lucky enough to have a really great close community of friends who wanted to do this as well. And we were constantly at each other's houses, practicing, playing, listening to records, because uh, that's what we had. We had record. We didn't have anything else but LPs, and uh, that's what we had at the time. For uh, that was our source. That and the radio. Um, that's that was really how we learned how to play. And from going to hang out and hearing people play, and trying to sit in and try and get better at this craft. Uh, but yeah, Rich DeRosa is a childhood friend. I knew his dad, Clem DeRosa, who was a very important jazz educator in New York. Um, provided a lot of opportunities for young musicians to play. He had a number of big bands on Long Island, which were uh, kind of the springboard for a lot of people's young musicians from that area's careers. He was a very hugely important 
person uh, for many, many years. And uh, Rich DeRose was uh, also one of those guys on the scene back then in New York, playing with everybody, and got into writing, and now he's here. You know, he the faculty here, I just want to say, first of all, is just tremendous. This is a very special place in, the, in, in terms of jazz education and music in general. Just, uh, it's really magical, and you guys are really lucky to be here. This is uh, an intentional community. You guys all want to be here, and uh, I really hope that you make the best of your time and take advantage of all your professors because they're all world-class musicians and jazz musicians and teachers, and, and you know they're here. They, we, we want you guys to be successful. That's really important. Um, I had great teachers growing up. Uh, great tenor saxophonist Billy Mitchell, the saxophone player Chris Woods. I mean, so I had so many mentors and people who were really helpful to me um, to uh, just get better at this craft. And so it's just a big circle. You know, teaching and, and uh, young musicians is really important. It's a calling, and we, it's important for us to continue to do that in a way to just to give thanks for our teachers. I mean. I, I, the number of people who helped me, it's, it's innumerable. I can't even begin to tell everybody, name all the names, but uh, without them, I certainly wouldn't be here. So um, coming and doing these clinics and talking to young musicians and teaching is uh, it's really important, and it just keeps the whole thing going. Yeah. One of the things that um, I think really strikes me about your playing is there are a lot of baritone players who can play the chair, you know, they can play the instrument, make I'm sound come chair. out. Well, I, I'm, what I mean is, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of baritone players who don't approach the instrument as, I, I would say, artistically as you do. And I was wondering, as someone who has an established sound, an established voice on baritone, what is your perspective on the role of the instrument in a big band? Um. <laughs> Wow. Um, I never really thought about it in any of those terms. I just thought about trying to, you know, I, I was trying to f find some kind of a personal identity on the instrument. And, but I think that happens with time. I mean, we all go through a long period, and it's, and it's essential that we go through a period of imitation, right? We all need a musical hero when we're younger. We have to model our style on, on somebody who we just, who's playing, we absolutely love. And then through the years and through playing and experience and hopefully you know maturing, our sound, personal sound and personality evolves out of that. So you, it's you know my hero was I. Well, I had a lot of heroes. I did. I didn't start playing baritone until I was 22. I played. I was a really, uh, really dedicated alto player. In fact, playing the baritone was never on my radar. I never wanted to play this instrument. This was just. Uh, this whole thing was just a, uh, a big accident. No, I'm serious. I was 22. I was, uh, I was a senior in college on Long Island. And uh, I was been to Phil Woods and Charlie Parker and Cannibal Ireland and or, you know, Gene Quill and just, uh, you know, so just I was in alto there. Jackie McLean, this just goes on and on. And I have no, this was, somebody told me when I was 15 or 16 years old that I'd be sitting in Pepper Adams' chair at the Vanguard. I'd be thinking, no. I had a better chance of going to the moon than that. I mean, there's just no way. That was just something that was, first of all, I wasn't interested. And second of all, it was so unreal and so in fantasy land. So, but anyway, so I'm in college. I'm, it's May of 1978, and the phone rings, and it's Woody Herman's band. And they want to know if I can join the band playing baritone in two weeks. This is uh, May of 1978. I'm, I'm a senior in college. I'm two weeks away from graduating and the phone rings. And so I had to make a decision. I said, well, do I stay in school and get my degree, or do I leave school before and buy a baritone? Yeah, <laughs> and I figured, well, this, I can always go back to school, but I can't, this is, if I turn this down, I'm never gonna have, have a chance to go on the road like this, which, you know, probably not. Because, you know, at that point, what he's, 1978, the band was on the road 50 weeks a year. They're playing all the time. So I figured, well, I mean, I'll try this. So I said I agreed and I uh, never finished school and went out and bought a student model Yamaha baritone with a stock mouthpiece and a handful of reeds and took the train up to Bridgeport, Connecticut and May 25th, 1978, I took my baritone out of the case. I had two weeks to try and figure out what this instrument was. I had to get a sad, no concept of sound. I mean, I never really listened to baritone players. I mean, it just was not something that I did very much. I was like 
really diehard alto player. So I had two weeks to try and get prepared. I had to memorize Four Brothers, and I had to memorize the baritone part of Early Autumn. Because those were the first two tunes of every set, and the saxophone section went out front and played it by memory. We didn't have any music. So, but I was able to do that, and so I take out my, my baritone out of the case, and I sit down in the baritone chair, and I look to, to my right, and sitting there is Joe Lovano. <laughs> so, hey, I'm Oh, Joe Lovano. Back then, we were just, you know, we were just young musicians starting out. He was 23, 24, maybe. Uh, but John Riley was playing drums, and Mark Johnson was playing bass, and he was, in, you know, he was uh, getting ready for uh, to audition for Bill Evans' trio, which he wound up getting, and he left the band. Um, so it was a really, I mean, the band was incredible. But I, I just, that was, and and that was a turning point in that uh, that phone call altered my path. It was like. Uh, it put me in a direction that I never intended or thought about or even dreamed about. Um, but I, I, was, I never played the alto again, that was it. I just, I grew after two years to really love the baritone. But it took me a really long time just to get inside the sound because I, I had no concept of sound. So I listened to Harry Carney, Pepper Adams, Nick Brignola, Ryan Cuber. I listened to cello players, Pablo Casals and Yo-Yo Ma, because the baritone is cello-like. It's got, it has a cello-like quality to it as well. So I really got into the, the sonic quality of the baritone, because that was the thing that I didn't have. I had technique and chops I could play for playing the alto, uh, but I had no idea what the sound was. Um, so once again, through imitating and listening and copying and playing along with records, you know, developed a, a sound, and that was very deeply rooted in, in Charlie Parker and Pepper Adams. Those were my two main influences in, on the saxophone. And uh, eventually, you know, through time, your sound and your personality and your character and all the, all the qualities that you have in your life emerge, to, and you become you. It takes a long time to become you on your instrument. You know what I mean? So. There's a long process of imitating and copying. So don't be in a hurry. No, seriously. You know, it's a, this is an important process of, of gaining your identity as a musician is this long process of imitating and having a hero. You need to have a hero. It's important. Yes, I was. So I didn't, int I didn't personally like, intend to do any of this you know, with any kind of, in, you know, there was no intent behind it. I just, I just wanted to get better and be the best baritone player I could be. All this other stuff that happened was a byproduct of that. I never said, oh, I'm going to win the down. I'm going to win the downbeat poll. I'm going to win the jazz. I'm going to buy. I never thought about any of that. That just happened. I mean, that, and that was, and that was also a big surprise. All that stuff. Everything. My whole life had, has been like this, you know, crazy. All these really amazing things have happened, but. It's all been just because I was interested in being a better player. It was just I wanted to be the best musician I can be. I never set out to make a record. I never set out to be, you know, to, to, I had to set up no. I just, for me, all that stuff is a byproduct of just trying to be a deeper musician. I think we have time for one more question. What three o'clock where is this? Hi there. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I uh, was sitting over here whenever you guys were rehearsing at the one o'clock, and I uh, noticed that one of the first things that you said to the band was, "I'm, I'm nervous." Yeah. And um, we actually, like Andrew mentioned, we had Kenny Werner come um, last spring semester uh -huh. and gave a talk, and we pushed the whole effortless mastery thing, and that was really insightful to me. Yeah. Um, I just wondered how you take some of those things into account, and maybe if you have like methods to approaching your playing and maybe kind of becoming like beyond like your horn or yourself. It's kind of, that's kind of like a philosophical <laughs> end to that, but. Um, well, I, well, you mean in terms of like when you play, you kind of disappear? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I mean, that's, you know, I like that concept. It's, it's uh, but and I think essentially, and, you know, maybe if you're lucky, that happens a handful of times in your life where you cease to exist and there's just music. Mm. You know, I think you have to kind of be a, I mean, I, I don't think that's a common occurrence in terms of where you just kind of become one. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's something, it's a, it's a lofty goal to try and achieve. Mm. But um, I think Bill Evans said that he, he, that happened to him twice in his life where he felt like the piano ceased to exist and it was just music. Um, that's something you can't practice. 
I mean, that's not, you can, you can certainly have a, some kind of approach in terms of how you approach being a musician and what you do, whether it's you meditate or walk or whatever it is that you do that kind of helps you find some kind of a calm space or a space that helps you, you know, to try and, where you can, everything is flowing really free without any blocks. I mean, that, but, um, you know, when you're actually in the act of playing and trying to achieve that, it's not, it's not so easy, I don't think, you know? Um, it's a fantastic thing to try and, you know, to try and, it's a really beautiful goal. But I think that's just, once again, that's a byproduct of being as good as you can be. Mm. You know, I mean, that's an also thing that happens. That's an organic process by being a better musician. I don't know if that's something that you can practice as such. I also, that's the thing I think Kenny's also talking about, not being judge, self-judgmental, mm. not attachment. <laughs> don't, don't fall in love with anything you play. Just put the music out there in the world, and then that's it. You know, you just put it out there, and, and tomorrow you get another chance, just, just keep putting music out there. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, but not being like, oh God, that, be you know, so uptight to the point where you're just so worried about every note you play that you're paralyzed and you can't play anything. You know, because really the big bottom line is when you put music out there and it's just, and then it's gone. Mm. It's just one of those things, it's like smoke. You know, we play and it just disappears. And that's it. You know, it's just bad, especially when you're playing improvised music. We're just, we're, we're making music up and just putting it out into the world. And it's not good and it's not bad, it just is. Mm. You know what I mean? I think it's really important to not be so self-deprecating and so, you know, I think, and, and one of the other things that really is, is uh, and that's, this is one thing that I think Facebook is a drag for, is that you, you compare yourself to other people. You look at what other people are doing on Facebook, and you're like, this guy's got a tour, this guy's got a record, this guy's going here, such and such is doing it, and you're like, oh man, I'm not doing any of that. And it just makes you feel bad about your, you know, and I'm guilty, I do that too, right? I see people, oh man, this guy's doing this, oh man, really? You know, so I, I just think it's really, uh, um, comparing yourself to other people is not necessary. Just stay on your path and just play how you play and, you know, kind of um, be passionate about the music that you're passionate about and that you love to play. And then just kind of, you'll find your path and you'll find your people and you'll find people who want to do that as well. And uh, all this other stuff is just going to be, it's just going to happen very naturally by virtue of you just being as good as you can be. Thank you. All right. Have a Gary Smolian.